Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm, I'm Ann Harrison. I'm the Dean of the Haas School of Business. Welcome to today's Dean Speaker Series. Uh, today we're joined by Jonathan Johnson. He's the president of Medici Ventures, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of Overstock.com that was founded in 2014 to apply blockchain technologies to existing industries. Jonathan joined Overstock in 2002 as the company's general counsel, and he's been an integral part of the company's rapid growth from a small startup to a publicly traded company. He's served in a variety of leadership positions, including five years as the company's president and chairman of the board of directors. We're very lucky to have him here today. In his current role at Medici Ventures, he's really questioning the status quo. He's building a portfolio of companies that are leading the introduction of blockchain technologies in an industry such as capital markets, money and banking, identity, property, voting, and supply chain. He'll also tell you about some of his ventures in emerging markets, which are very exciting. I just was hearing about those. He also has experience in the public sector. He ran for governor of Utah in 2016. There's no question that he says he can't answer. Um, so also joining us is, is Holly Schrotz. She's a senior lecturer and distinguished teaching fellow here at Haas, and she'll be leading today's conversation. She'll be asking some of those questions. Holly's been a member of the Haas faculty since 1992. Uh, she teaches courses in negotiations and conflict resolution and organizational behavior. She's an award-winning teacher here at Haas. She's, she's won the Chite Award twice in 2009 and most recently in 2018. And it was through Holly's course, Leading People, that our evening and weekend MBA student, Ted Tobacco, where, Ted, where are you? Say hello to everyone. He um, is through him that Holly learned about uh, Jonathan Johnson um, and uh, we su suggested that he come to Haas for the Dean's Speaker Series. So we have Ted to thank for helping us to get Jonathan here today. We're really excited. Um, and we really appreciate student suggestions. So students, you should take that as an example. Uh, if you have brilliant suggestions for people to come and, and speak here, um, please bring them to us. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming uh, Jonathan Johnson and Holly Scott. Thank you, everybody, for coming out today. I'm so looking forward to talking with you. And in our uh, quick conversation in the green room, you told me a very interesting story of how your company got its name. And I thought we'd start with that. So Medici Ventures uh, is involved in blockchain technology. The Medici family of ancient Florence is said to have introduced double bookkeeping accounting to the West. And that's how they became bankers and wealthy and great patrons of the arts. Blockchain technology is really a distributed ledger, multiple entry bookkeeping, so to speak. So in a nod to the Medici family and all that they did, we picked our name for our blockchain company to be Medici Ventures. Very good. So I'd like you to give us a little bit of background of your path to your role right now today. Well, my path is untraditional, and I've, and I've found that most people, uh, when they're young, figure that the path to success is straight and planned. Mine was not straight, uh, nor was it planned. Uh, I started uh, as a lawyer. I often say I'm a recovering lawyer, about nine years clean. Uh, <laughs> but I will say I do fall off the wagon now and again. Uh, I, I practiced law for big law firms in the Los Angeles area. I joined a 
software company uh, in the late 90s uh, as their general counsel became their CFO. That company expanded and contracted uh, in the internet bust, uh, then joined Overstock about 17 years ago as its legal department of one. Uh, was very excited when they asked me to take on a non-legal role, wear more of a business hat, became the president, helped the company become profitable, grow from a small startup to a big company. I then took a two, couple of years off to do what was maybe the most expensive and most fruitless midlife crisis and ran for governor uh, <laughs> and lost. My wife has said, next time, let's just buy an expensive sports car. <laughs> um, but the good news was, uh, when I had been serving on the Overstock board and went after the election defeat, uh, the board asked me to come back and work on what was then kind of a nascent blockchain business that had wrapped itself around the axles, didn't really have leadership, and they said, please come in. You helped us as a startup at Overstock, help us nurture these startups. And in the three years since then, we have now have 19 companies in our portfolio uh, doing things as diverse as blockchain voting to land titling to capital markets, supply chain, all kinds of things. It has been a wonderful ride. But the thing that I would say has made it most interesting is that there is always something new to learn. And when, I, when people ask me, what should I be focused on as a student? My response is always, learn how to learn and learn to love to learn. Because the job that you will have 20 years from now is likely a job that does not exist today. When I was a law student, e-commerce wasn't a thing. And I grew up to run an e-commerce company. When I was the president, first the president of Overstock, blockchain wasn't a thing. Now I'm helping blockchain companies get out of the nest and fly. What you're going to be doing in 20 or 30 years most likely isn't a thing. But if you're ready to learn and you learn to love to learn, you will be successful no matter what the thing is that you become. We were talking about failure earlier, yeah. and you had a really interesting perspective on failure. Can you share that with the group? Well, I think failure is to be expected. Uh, and if we don't embrace failure, we won't embrace innovation, we won't embrace change. And a couple of places that failure works into our culture is, one, with our executive team. We meet every Monday morning, and every member of the executive team has a series of projects that they've committed to complete. Maybe a weekly project or a six-month project, it may be a long-term project. When that project comes up on our checklist for the executive to report on, we have two appropriate answers that the executive can start his or her report with. The first is the project is complete. Then we talk about what it is and how it got completed and what we do next. But the second appropriate answer, and I say appropriate because it is appropriate, is I have failed. Now, most people that are on an executive team are going to do everything they can to never have to say, I have <laughs> failed. And what we found is having that reporting structure does several things. One is it encourages people to take ownership of the project because they are the captain. It used to be that when we would say, what's the status of the project, it's stuck in legal. I'm waiting for accounting to tell me how to do it. Marketing's got to do something where there's a lot of finger pointing. We didn't like that. We wanted someone to own the project. The other thing is when they, someone reports, I have failed, they don't get fired. They don't get reprimanded. The questions are then two. When do you think you can complete this? We'll put it on the agenda again. And what can we as an executive team too do to help you complete this? And that's when they say, you know, I could really use some help from legal or from marketing or from IT. Um, and so that perspective, uh, we try and encourage people to be aggressive and get things done. But if they fail, they're not punished. And case in point, for 16 years, I have had a project at overstock.com 
to get a certain URL that we want to use. For 16 years at different intervals, I have stood up in our executive meeting or our board meetings and said, I have failed. <laughs> we don't have it yet. We are oh so close right now. I can't wait to say project complete. But every time I say that, I think it sets an example to others in the team to say it's OK to fail as long as you're really trying to get things done. Can you uh, describe your leadership style? Uh, so uh, a couple things I would say about how I try and lead is one, to be really transparent and open and elicit feedback. And so at a company-wide level, that means providing monthly financials that we go over as an entire company at Medici Ventures. We see where we've performed fa favorable to plan and unfavorable to plan. When I give a report every quarter to the Overstock and the Medici boards, I give the exact same report to all of our employees. Uh, unredacted, same report. Uh, when, I, when, when the company decided to come up with values, when I started at Medici three years ago, we involved every employee. The management team put something together, we ran it past our board, and then we spent three separate days, about four hours a day, with every employee in the room, going over sentence by sentence what our vision and what our corporate culture would be. And I will tell you, where we came out at the end was different than where we started. It was better than where we started, and everyone had bought into it from where we started. So it wasn't Jonathan's corporate culture, wasn't the board's corporate culture, it was Medici Ventures' corporate culture. That kind of transparency is really, really important. The second thing I would say as part of my management style is giving broad latitude to the people that report to me. So our chief technology officer reports to me. I'm not a coder. Uh, I'm not a geek. Uh, using that term in the, the most flattering way possible. Uh, uh, there are a lot of people who report to me I don't know much about. I don't know much about their, what they do. So I rely on them to make decisions. And so, for example, when someone comes into my office and says, well, I ran Overstock and the merch, our head merchant came in and said, we want to go out and we grow into this area, I, would, I asked a lot of questions to the point where sometimes those who report to me feel like I might be cross-examining them. <laughs> But I always say when someone reports to me, I'm going to ask a lot of questions, but I want you to keep a tally of how frequently I take your recommendation, and that's what we do. I ask the questions because at the end of the day, if we take the recommendation, which I would say is 80 or 90 plus percent of the time, and it's wrong, I will take the blame. And if I haven't asked questions, I won't know why we made that decision. But if it's successful, I will give the credit. And I think that's a really important piece about managing. If you take blame and give credit, you empower the people that work for you to make decisions, to do things. If you take credit and give blame, what you've become is the ultimate micromanager. No one will ever make a decision because what's in it for them? If it goes south, they're in trouble. If it goes north, they get no credit. So it's really important to take blame and give credit. When uh, Ted interviewed you for my class, he had mentioned the commander's intent mm -hmm. as part of your style. Can you elaborate on what that is? Sure. C commander's intent is trying to get a military term. It's trying to give the people who are on the front lines an idea of what is best and what we're trying to accomplish, and then let them figure out how to do it. So to give an example on the Army, the general may say, we're going to take that hill. That's commander's intent. Now, the Army being what the Army is, it will for sure have an execution checklist of how to do it. Cross this bridge, go through this field, burn down this barn, and take the hill from the north. But when the infantry is in the heat of battle, and they see the hill is unassailable for the north, from the north, they know the commander's intent is to 
take the hill. Maybe they all parachute in or dig up from beneath or come from one of the sides. They can do that. Let me give a real world example that I found particularly useful from Overstock's history. I was the president of Overstock. We had, we, Overstock still has a, a customer service call center that tries to answer questions. And try as we might, we could not break the top 150 call centers, customer service friendly call centers. The National Retail Federation and Amex does a survey every year and they rank the 100, top 150. And I was convinced we were 151 every year. We went and we looked and there was a set of procedures in customer service like this. All these things that the agents had to follow. And every one of those rules had come with rhyme and reason behind it from some, from some situation where we said, okay, we need to create a new rule for that situation. What we did is we scrapped that stack of procedures and we gave commander's intent. Commander's intent is the customer deserves justice. Not the customer is always right, not we're always right, but the customer deserves justice. So I'll give two examples of how that played out. Let's say you come to Overstock and you buy a fancy diamond engagement ring. And two weeks later, you return it because your fiance didn't like the ring or she didn't like you. <laughs> and you return that ring and it comes back and our gemologist looks at it. And what you've returned is a beautiful cubic zirconium engagement ring. But you want full refund for the diamond ring you bought. The customer deserves justice means what? No refund or a small refund. We don't need a bunch of rules around that. Another example, you order a couch from Overstock. It shows up and one of the four legs is a half an inch shorter than the rest. You call our customer service agent, she's talking to you. She may be able to tell you are frustrated beyond belief and the best thing we can do is give you full refund and, have you, and pay for to have the couch sent back to us. She may say, that doesn't work. I have something this weekend. I need this couch. And you may say, well, we can overnight a leg to you. And you can screw it in and screw it off and we'll give you a $50 discount. She may love that. Or the customer service agent may say, you know what, that skirt, that skirt, or that couch has a skirt on it. What if we gave you a $300 discount on it and you just put a book underneath it? <laughs> Do you know which one a lot of, of those solutions Overstock customers like the best? The 300? The book, yeah, the $300. <laughs> the Only by giving the commander's intent to the frontline person to say the customer deserves justice can we figure out what makes the person most happy. We put that simple rule in place the next year we showed up as number four on the customer service list. And we stayed in the top five until NRF stopped doing that. Commander's intent means let people on the front line know the goal and let them achieve it the way they think is best. So that seems to also apply to motivation. Mm -hmm. And how do you motivate your employees? Well, it's changed over the years. Uh, I sound like an old man when I say that. Uh, I don't feel like an old man, but I realize I've been doing this for a long time. Today, I think what motivates employees is one, give, empower them to make decisions, which Commander's Intent does. Two, uh, let them make decisions, which I think my questioning style does and giving credit and taking blame does. And three, I think being really transparent so that they feel like they have a say in what's going on. When we go over our monthly financials in Medici Ventures and I can say, here's where we did against plan versus revenue, here's where we did against plan versus expenses, here's what it means to the accrued bonus. People really start caring about expenses. Wait a second, our expenses were off by this much and it meant we didn't accrue a bonus or we accrued a smaller bonus, we can take care of that. And so instead of punishing people, people say, I can fix that myself. I think that kind of empowerment is really important to, to motivating people. 
Do you see any differences with the new generation of employees versus the older generation of employees? Boy, uh, I do. And I, Holly and I were talking uh, before we came out here about an article that was in uh, the Wall Street Journal just yesterday about Generation Z employees expecting to be um, promoted each year and wanting to have a checklist of things to do. Uh, but I think checklists are tough. Uh, and I think checklists make it hard for you to succeed as an employee. Because if all you do is what you're told to do, uh, then we have to have an execution checklist all the way to the top of the hill to take the hill. There's no commander's intent. Um, we have a story we'd like to tell uh, at Overstock and at Medici about an old adage, uh, a newlywed calls her mother, she's going to make a ham for Easter Sunday. And she says, Mom, you make the best ham. Tell me the, res the recipe. And she says, well, the first thing you do is you cut off both ends of the ham. And she goes, well, why don't we cut off both ends of the ham? She says, I don't know. Let's call your grandmother. They call the grandmother. Well, the first thing you do is you cut off both ends of the ham. Why do we do that? I don't know. Let's call your great-grandmother. They call the great-grandmother. Why don't we cut off both ends of the ham? And she says, well, it's because when I first moved into the house, we had a really small oven, and I couldn't fit a ham in unless we cut both ends off. If people don't think for themselves, if all they're good is executing on checklists, it's like cutting off both ends of the ham. We have bigger ovens today. We have a different world we live in. I don't know how to solve so many of the problems I'm asking my employees to solve. I want them to figure it out. That's really important. And I think we're losing a little bit of that uh, with Gen Z. And I don't want to sound like an old man and say, in the old days we used to. <laughs> but I do think as you enter the workforce, solve, being a problem solver will help you climb a ladder faster than executing a series of checklists will ever do. So your company has a very strong culture. How do you transmit that to new employees, and how do you select employees to make sure they actually will fit into your culture? Culture is hard. And once you have a culture, it changes or wants to change every day. Um, and anytime you add someone new into it, it changes the culture. It's kind of like a family. Uh, I've got two sons that we were married a couple of years ago. It changed our family dynamic when we finally had daughters-in-law in, in our family. It changed it for the better. Some culture changes for the better when new people come, but what we do to maintain what we like about our culture is we make sure everybody that we're interviewing has a list of our corporate culture. We have a page and a half that defines who we are. We give that to them. We talk to them about it. If it doesn't fit for them, we'd rather weed them out early than have them hire someone that six weeks or six months later is unhappy. That's a fail for us and a fail for them. We also sit down every six months in Medici Ventures and we bring all of our employees together and we go through our corporate mission statement and culture. We say, are we living up to this? Have we strayed from this? What if this needs to change? Culture shouldn't always be static. It should change. And so we morph it and change it from time to time. I think having those discussions, make it so people feel like they have influence, creates buy-in, and it makes culture perpetuate and last. So you're going into emerging markets. Yeah. How does, uh, how do your, how does your company build relationships with these uh, different uh, cultures, and how do you work uh, effectively with them? Well, yeah, it's interesting. Medici Ventures has 19 portfolio companies. One's down in the Caribbean and Barbados. One is doing a lot of work in Africa. Uh, one is uh, in Israel, applying blockchain to the wine business. Um, another's down in Argentina. So we deal with cultures around the world. Um, Part of it is being adaptive and figuring out what the culture is there and what we can and can't change. Uh, part of it is working with institutions that can help us learn the culture as we go in. And I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing with a portfolio company called Medici Land Governance. Much of the developing world doesn't have legally recognized land titling, which is a hard thing for us to fathom here, because if you bought a house, you would go down to the county recorder. They would say, 
where the meets and bounds are, who owns it, what liens are on it, what bank liens you have to get rid of for you to own it. In the developing world, that doesn't exist. The county recorder's office doesn't exist. It might be a tribal chieftain or a co-op, or it could be scrawled on a hide of a, of a dead cow. I mean, it can, be, it can be any of these ways. What we're trying to do is put land title Register it on the blockchain so it becomes a legal title that people can prove. To get that done, we have to work with governments to convince them that's a good idea. We found that working with the World Bank, I know the dean used to work with the World Bank, working with the World Bank has been a great entree and allowed us to get in there. So finding institutions that are familiar with the local culture is really important, having them introduce us. We certainly don't want to be you know, the big bad capitalist from the West that says this is how you have to do it, but find ways where they find it in their best interests to get it done so it will help their population unleash dead capital, land, so that they can borrow against it, sell it, demise it, do whatever they want to do with it to start businesses. So that's one of the ways we've been working on it. So we were talking about negotiation skills a bit, and you told me a really interesting story of when you were working in Japan that I would love for you to share with them. So when I was a still wet behind the ears attorney, uh, I had a lot of clients that were Japanese companies. And I'd been practicing about a year when one company, Bondi, which is the largest toy company in Japan, and at that time their most successful property was Power Rangers. Uh, I, was, I was told my young son that when he wanted to know what I did at work, and I said, when the Power Rangers can't win their fights, they come to your dad. Uh, he told his preschool teacher that one day, and she called my wife saying, your son is saying some crazy stuff. Uh, but I was representing the Power Rangers, and they were the big 800-pound gorilla in this negotiation with a small company that wanted to put Power Rangers on t-shirts and underwear for little kids, kind of like the underoos model. And I went to Bondi and I said, what are the things that we want to get in this negotiation? That was list about 10. So I went, negotiated with the other side all by myself, felt very proud, and I won all 10 points. And I felt really happy. Came back to the client and said, hey, here's the contract, it's all ready to sign, here's what we got. And the client looked at me crestfallen and said, this contract's no good. I said, wait a second, you wanted 10 things, I got 10 things. He said, the problem with this contract is it's too one-sided. We win, they lose. And in a year, they'll be out of business and we'll be looking for someone else to put the red, the yellow, and the green Power Ranger on underwear. Go back and negotiate a fair contract. So I... Went back to my office, called the opposing counsel, and I go, I'm sorry, the client won't accept this contract. <laughs> they said, wait a second, we gave you everything. And I said, I know. I'm here to give some of it back. There have to be ways in business to create win-win situations. Litigation may be win-lose, but business is win-win. And if you can find out what's important to the party across the table from you and help them win while you too win, then you've got a business relationship that won't last a year but can last a long, long time. So in negotiations, I want to know what it is that makes you win so I can figure out how you can win while I win. Your business is rapidly changing. Mm. You have a really strong culture. How do you initiate change and implement it and maybe negotiate new positions within your company? Well, we are growing. And anytime you're in a growing group, I think part of what you have to do to initiate change is let people that are doing things know that they're doing too much and we need someone else to do part of what they're doing. Some people embrace that. They're like, oh, I can do, I can focus on what I want to do. But a lot of people think that if you take something away from them, they've failed and, or they're being demoted. But as companies grow, People that were great at the beginning don't always stay great at the next level. And so I think you need to be brutally honest with people and say, and it's really hard, particularly when you're a startup and your blood, sweat, and tears together, and you outgrow someone, to find a place that fits for them 
or to sometimes have to say, Bob, we've outgrown you. Uh, bringing in new people, I think, helps bolster Bob before you have to let him go, helps him find something new. Uh, but you gotta, I think you have to recognize who's being outgrown and try and help them find a place that fits before they don't fit anymore. <coughs> We have a lot of students with startups, and I was just talking about that in my class today. Mm -hmm. What advice do you have for people who are doing startup companies? That you when, when Medici looks at different startups to invest in, and we chose to invest in 19, and we probably look at 10 a week, we look for three things in a startup. Uh, we look for people who have industry expertise. You may have come up with a great idea about how to change voting, but not know that county clerks are over the voting system, or not know anything about that. You've got to have somebody that has industry expertise. We look for people that have great technologists. We're, soft, we're investing in software companies, so great technologists are important. And then we look for someone that I call the huckster. Who can sell? Who can sell? Ultimately, if you've got a product that you can't get someone to buy, doesn't solve a problem, and it doesn't meet a market price, it doesn't work. So that's what we look for. Layered above that is the character of the people. At the end of the day, and we're mostly seed and Series A investors, these are startups that don't yet have great balance sheets, don't yet have a product in production. We're betting on people, and character is king. We want people who the Army describes what they like as be, know, and do. Be is character. People with the right be, who are going to do the right thing. Know is knowledge, and do is they're going to work hard. You're never going to work more hours than when you've got a startup. That's for sure. So we look for people with the be, no do character traits. Can you tell me what character traits specifically you look for? Uh, well, uh, honesty, candidness. Uh, when I'm hiring people in particular, I want people that are going to be candid with me. I don't need one more paid friend to tell me that my dumb idea is a good idea. I want uh, employees, colleagues that say, Jonathan, that's a dumb idea. Or that's an OK idea, but it would be a really great idea if we did this. Candor is hard to find. Uh, and then loyalty, I think, is important. Loyalty to the cause. Not necessarily loyalty to me, but loyalty to the cause that we're trying to push forward uh, as Medici Ventures. Do you have a technique for discerning whether someone is honest, has integrity? So one thing I do when I interview people uh, is right at the beginning, I look at their resume and I say, you know, I see you worked at XYZ Company. Who did you report to there? Well, I reported to Sally. I said, could you give me Sally's phone number? I'm going to want to talk to her. Once they know that I might have to talk to Sally, that interview gets really honest. <laughs> I don't even have to call Sally. That interview gets really honest. And I frankly find they're more real. And the strengths are always told in every interview. But some of the weaknesses are, are a little bit more candid. And I would rather know those up front, because no one's perfect. No one's as strong as their resume looks. Uh, so that's a technique that I use to try and get people to be more honest and get a, a sense of who they are uh, in an interview. Can you give your best advice for our students of what they should think about while they're still a student in terms of what they should be looking to do? Well, I'll make it back right to the very beginning. Uh, learn how to learn and learn to love to learn because that's going to be your career. Uh, you know, when I was a student, I always thought when I graduate, from undergrad and get accepted to law school, then I will have arrived. When I graduate from law school and pass the bar, then I will have arrived. When I become a corner office partner, then I will have arrived. I never arrived, 
Never arrived there. Uh, everything was just different. And I just think we're going down crooked, crooked paths that frankly are going to lead to wonderful, wonderful places if you're willing to be a person who loves to learn and learns always. Which is why, one of the things I do, I'm a big goals person. I have a spreadsheet at home with all kinds of goals. I monitor my weight every day. I do all kinds of stupid things. Um, <laughs> but I have a goal to read a book a month. Some years I'm really great. I get a book a month. Some years I get 24 books in a year. Some years I get six. But the fact that I have a checklist where I fill it out, and at the end of each month I look at it and say, is this what I did? It's one of the things that helps me continue to learn because one of my goals is reading certain kinds of books and, and being involved. And I think you know one of our defining principles is students always. Students so, always. Yeah. The other ones I loved, I was up pointing the wrong way. Confidence without attitude. What a great, great credo. And what does that mean to you? Well, uh, one thing I think it means is understanding that everyone is a person. No one's beneath you and no one's above you. That, that attitude, attitude can go both ways. It can be cowering to the person that's really important or it can be lording over someone you think is not important. That doesn't work. And life is long and the person that you towered over at one point, at some point, might be your boss, right? You never know who's what you have to kiss on the way up, you might have to, wanna, I forget what that statement is, but there's something like that. Something like that, that just, so I think, you know, to me it means, and then just being confident. One thing I've found is, don't be afraid to say, I don't know. One of the things I learned is when I was a political candidate, traveling around Utah, doing town halls, I got asked all kinds of questions I did not know. I remember the first time I was in a little town hall in rural Utah and someone raised their hand and they said, JJ, what's your position on industrial hemp? <laughs> I don't know. Here are my general governing ideas. Tell me what I should read about industrial hemp. Tell me what you think and give me your phone number. And my rule was never be stumped by the same question twice. So three weeks later, I'm in another little rural town. Someone raises their hand. JJ, what's your position on industrial hemp? What's the deal with industrial <laughs> hemp? Other than I got a position on it now. It was awesome. So don't be afraid to say, I don't know. Uh, I say it all the time. And then I go learn. So I don't have to say, it. I don't know the same thing twice. So as future employees, mm -hmm. what's your big, best advice for them entering a company? Uh, find a mentor, I have several pieces of advice. Find a mentor, uh, find a friend. Those are sometimes two different things. Work is a lot more fun when you've got a friend there. Find someone who can mentor you in the culture. Doesn't need to be someone in your department, but someone who can tell you how the culture works. Someone that you can go to ask for advice. And I think finding a mentor is much easier than we think about it in our heads. I don't know anybody who doesn't like to give advice. <laughs> That's why I'm here today. You can ask me to come. I flew from Salt Lake to give it I don't know anybody that doesn't like to give advice. If you say, I need your advice, I would like to come to you once a month and ask you for some advice how it works in this company, they will come and do it. Uh, when my, I've got five children, five sons, and when they say, Dad, what can I do to be a good employee? I always tell them this, make your boss's life easier. If you make your boss's life easier, you are going to nonstop rocket to the top. That's what I say. Uh, that doesn't mean don't find problems. It means find problems, report them early, but try and have a solution. I love hearing about problems as soon as someone knows about it. I don't want it festering and getting worse, but I love it when someone who's found a problem says, hey, I found this problem. Here's two or three ways we could solve it. I think we ought to use way C. That makes my life Easy. You make your boss's life easy, you're going to have a great, great career. Some of my leading people students think I paid you to say that because no. I see them nodding their heads because I said it in class, but it sounds so much better when it comes from you than it does from me. My kids don't take any of my advice, but when my friends <laughs> give them that advice, hey, that's great advice. What's this? What am I? 
So my last question is for our students who are going to now lead a company, manage others, what is your best advice for them? Uh, managing others, managing is hard, and managing you grow into places. Uh, let, me, let me give this advice. My first management job was at a company where I had been a non-manager and had lunch with all the non-managers and griped about the company like all employees do. And then I became a manager and it felt lonely because I couldn't go to lunch with those same, I could go to lunch, but the discussion was different. I couldn't be part of the griping. Um, and I had to be part of the solution. So as you grow up in a company to a management job, you lose some of your camaraderie. And I like to think of the Shakespeare play, Henry V. Henry V, prior to that play, and the previous play is Prince Hal. Prince Hal hangs out, he's like a ne'er-do-well prince, hangs out in the bar with Falstaff and have fun, they goofballs, and that's what they do. But he becomes King Henry, and they're about to fight the French at Agincourt, he has to take on a totally different persona. And how he deals with Falstaff, his old drinking buddy, shows the troops who he is and is their leader. Sometimes you have to step up and relationships get a little different. And that's hard because we want to be everyone's friend. But managers have to remember they're there to do the company's work and make the company work better. So that's, that's part of it. As you're starting your own company, uh, Hire good people. Hire people that are smarter than you. Hire people that ultimately are going to do things better than you do. They probably won't do what you can do on day one as well as you can do on day one, but you hope by day 90 they can do it better than you so you can focus on different things. And it's really hard starting a company to let go of things. You feel like you're losing control. What you're really doing is empowering your company to be much better and much stronger. Are there any parting words of wisdom that you haven't already uh, given us? Oh, I stumped thing. you. It's a weird <laughs> question. Yeah. That's all I got. Uh, uh, I am sorry we didn't ask questions. I meant to. Uh, we're going to ask questions. Okay. I just well, well let me tell you this about ask. I love it when we ask questions because I learned as a candidate when I stood in front of a room that when I was giving my stump speech, I was only guaranteed that one person in the room cared what I was saying. <laughs> but if I answered a question, all of a sudden I doubled the number of people who cared about what I was saying. So I do think listening to people is a really important part of, of managing, because uh, you'll get ideas. And I think a lot of people, when they get in charge, talk too much and don't listen enough. So I hope we have time for questions and we yes, can answer we questions. I only have one request on questions. Oh, yes. Okay. So One request is use the microphones. Two is tell me your name. Yes, I let's like take questions. And nothing is off limits. And I may say I don't know. <laughs> tell me about it, about industrial hemp. I'll figure it out. <laughs> oh, first question. All right, not a hemp question. Uh, <laughs> my name is Christian. I'm a second year MBA student here at Haas. I'm part of blockchain at Berkeley. Uh, so if it's okay, I'd like to ask a blockchain question that you Please. might be particularly well suited to answer, uh, like given your lawyerly background and your position at Medici. So um, the SEC recently issued its ruling about uh, initial coin offerings. They said they like issued the no action letter to a couple of places. Um, and the, the broad theme is that now there are kind of real rules about what you can and can't do in the blockchain space to abstract it off a level. Um, you wrote an article for TechCrunch that said that one of the things that you think should be done in the blockchain space is kind of to deregulate, to not have a lot of regulation, to not prevent people from uh, innovating in new ways. So I just wanted to ask you, number one, like given this new ruling, how are you going to respond? How are your portfolio companies going to respond? Um, but two, if we do want to kind of build the credibility of blockchain and maybe have it be a little more high integrity uh, kind of with the conversation we were talking about before, um, do you think that regulations could help in kind of regulating some of the more bad behavior that's happened in the blockchain space so far? Christian, great question. Thank you. And boy, I'd have someone read something you said in TechCrunch, now I feel like I'm on the spot, but be good. Well, well researched question. Um, I think some regulation is important. Where the SEC was before the recent guidance that they gave made it hard for people that wanted to obey the law to know where the lines were. 
and regulating through enforcement is unfair. If we didn't have speed limit signs and you didn't know what the speed limit was until you got pulled over and got a ticket, that's regulating through enforcement. We gotta put some signs up. So I like regulation that gives clarity so that people that want to obey the rules can <laughs> obey the rules. I think pre this set of SCC rules, there was no clarity and people were flagrantly speeding when there was no sign at all, right? I mean, it was just a joke. Um, I like what the SCC's done. I think it's only the beginning. And what they've done is they've said, I'm gonna use an analogy. The big question when people issue secured or initial coin offerings, give a token to raise money for their business, is whether that coin is a security or not. And the analogy that people have used in the past, I think is pretty good, is if I have an arcade and I'm raising money to start an arcade, and I haven't built it yet, and I'm, you're giving me money for that, that's clearly a security. If I have an arcade and I'm raising money and giving you tokens so that you can play video games in the arcade, Pac-Man and Asteroids, and I've dated myself, and those games exist, that's not a security. If I'm raising money and give you a coin because I'm gonna build the next versions of the video games we're gonna play in there, that is a security. All of that was clear under the securities laws, but unclear for folks issuing coins or initial coin offerings. I think what the SEC basically said is, same as it ever was, if you have video games that are already existing and we're giving you something that plays in that system, you can use in that system, it's not a security. I think that was good guidance. I don't think it's particularly new guidance. I'd like to see a little bit more. Um, I'm generally a less regulation than more is better guy, but I think no regulation leads to uncertainty for business, so we need some regulation. Christian, does that address your question? Yes, thank you. Yeah, good question. It's a detailed question. <laughs> Other questions? He'll ask, he'll take any question. Oh, good. <laughs> Tell me your name. Hi, uh, my name is Neha. I'm a first, uh, first year MBA here. Um, so earlier you talked about Gen Z and how, it, how the culture is kind of shifting towards wanting checklists. Um, that's something that I struggled a lot with at my old company. We, um, as a, especially some of us who are younger managers, struggled with finding ways to coach our younger employees to develop more independent thinking instead of relying on checklists. Um, so I'd love to hear any strategies you have personally found to work that encourage more independent thinking from uh, some of your more junior employees? So, uh, hard question, thank you for asking it. And it's hard because I'm still figuring it out. Uh, but I think part of that is giving people projects and asking them to figure out how to do something. And part of what I mentioned how I like to manage the people I have, my direct reports and have one-on-ones with them is I want them to come with their list of things they want to talk about. This isn't my meeting, it's their meeting. I may have some things after they finish talking. When they have a problem that they're addressing or want advice on, I always ask for their recommendation first. A lot of times, I know the answer. I know what I would do. I've dealt with it before, I'm ready to go but I wanna hear what they have to say. And if it's better than what I was thinking, we go with it. If it's close enough to what I was thinking, I'll generally go with it because I want them to see that their decision is a good decision. I don't wanna to dictate to them all the time. And if it's really far from what I think the right solution is, I'll try and ask questions, use the Socratic method so that they get to a place where they think, you know, what I proposed isn't awesome, but I've, as we've talked, I've come up with this solution I think is better. I'm like, ah, 
These are not the droids you are looking for, right? This is, and they figured it out without me saying, we should be doing this. So I think that develops better thinking and more autonomy and empowers them to make choice. Does that address the question? Okay. By the way, leave if you got some. I'm not gonna, I'm not taking a roll. Don't feel like you gotta, get trapped, you're chained to your chairs. So. Hi, I'm Joshua, I'm a EW MBA student with Ted in um, the first year cohort. And uh, I have kind of a selfish question is I've gone to these career management group sessions and they ask us to come up with our why statements of like what motivates us to do what we do. And so I'm looking for good examples because it's something I'm really struggling with. And so what is your why statement? Why do you do what you do? Mm. Uh, one, I really like my job. Uh, I like being in a new space. I like being at Overstock when it was 50 people. I did not like it when it grew to 2,500 people. It was just different. So for me, being in a, in a company that's helping other companies start, fledgling start and get out of the nest, I love doing that. But I, I also have a little bit of an underdog Rocky Balboa in me. Why would anyone else run against an incumbent governor with 72% approval rating and lose? Right? Uh, <laughs> from the same party, no less. Uh, I think blockchain is going to change the world. I think it's going to be bigger than the internet. Uh, I want to be part of that. And you say something like that today, and people go, you're a nut. I don't even know what that is, right? I mean, it's all about mining and hash graphs. And I think it's going to change the world. And I love being involved in something with that kind of huge uh, possibility. So, um, and then I'll also say, as I get more senior, I like mentoring other employees. I like taking them and making them feel like they're going to grow up and they're going to be part of, you know, Coach K at Duke. There's all these folks that are part of his genealogy that coach all over college basketball. I would love Utah and other places to be filled with JJ genealogy managers that are <laughs> doing this kind of thing. That's, that's exciting to me too. By the way, blockchain changed the world, bigger than the internet. Two years ago, I was sitting at a dinner at the Australian Embassy in Washington, D.C. next to a guy named Robert Kahn. I didn't know who Robert Kahn was at the time, but I quickly found out. He and Vince Cerf are often acknowledged as the fathers of the internet, not Al Gore. <laughs> they invented the internet. And he leaned over to me and he said, hey, this blockchain thing is going to be bigger than the internet. And I thought, that's great. I've not only drunk the Kool-Aid, I'm drunk on the Kool-Aid. <laughs> but tell me why you, the father of the internet, think that. And he said, the internet was great at the free, flow, free and frictionless flow of information. But when you get something on the internet, it's always a copy. It's a picture. A picture is a copy of the picture I took. Or the website is a copy of the website. The blockchain lets us transfer digital assets, not a copy of a digital asset. When I give you a Bitcoin, the first killer app on the blockchain, you're not getting a copy of a Bitcoin that I can give to you and you and you. You're getting my Bitcoin, and that's what it is. That can be bigger than the Internet. And that's why it's so exciting. So I'm not sure that's a concise statement. It'll probably get an F in your class if you turn that Usually in. Usually it's one sentence, but yeah. Yeah, it was great. That was a great answer, though. That was a great answer. You put in a nickel, you get a dollar's worth. It's just vomiting. Sorry. I think you have another question. Hi, uh, I'm Kate, first year MBA and also part of blockchain at Berkeley. Um, thanks for your time today. Um, one of the things that I've heard kind of people talk about within the blockchain industry is so kind of some people accuse the industry of trying to run before it can walk. We're kind of trying to build all these application level kind of applications before we've kind of settled on a base protocol. I'm curious kind of how you'd respond to that and how you think the industry is going to emerge in, in terms of different protocols developing. Well, that's a really good question. Um, there is clearly no one blockchain or protocol that's perfect. They all have merits and demerits. Um, I don't think this is a VHS Betamax 
thing where there's going to be one that wins and everything else loses. I think there's going to be a lot of different protocols that are used for different things. At Medici Ventures, we are protocol agnostic. So our 19 portfolio companies, they probably don't use 19 different protocols, but they probably use 12 depending on what fits their use case the best. So I'm less concerned about which protocol wins. Rather, I like to see which protocol is best for the business case. The other thing I think is really important as this industry develops is blockchain is full of hope and hype, promise, possibility. We're trying to get our portfolio companies to stop focusing on promise and possibility and focus on product in production. And the reason for that is, and I found this true all the time when there's an idea. If I come up with a new idea and it's just in idea form, everyone can tell me why it won't work. Ideas are, there are a lot of doctor knows in this world. Ideas get to know. But if I show you an app, that works, that may be rudimentary, maybe that classic MVP, all of a sudden, Dr. No turns into, oh, wait a second, it does this? Can we get it to do that, this, and these other things, and those things? Product in production will make this go from a lot of hype to, I think, real, a thing that is. Does that address the question, Kate? Yeah, interesting, thank you. Thanks. Um, hi, my name is Jaime. Uh, hi, I'm a second nice year MBA you. here at Haas. Thank you so much for coming. Um, there's a lot of us here, I guess, my year is graduating now, so we're making a lot of decisions. Congratulations. On, thank you. It hasn't happened yet, but like, <laughs> you know. Um, it's close. Oh, so close. <laughs> I guess we're making a lot of decisions and thinking about that plan, right, and, and, and where you want to go and the decision to make next. It's... Uh, you can be wondering when you said you were going to, or you're trying to go into politics right now. So like, I guess after a, such a successful career, I was wondering what your thought of, what was your thought of why now? Like, why was your motivation there to create change and, and to see like uh, how you thought about that? Okay, just for clarification, I will not go into politics again. I gave it a shot. Here's what really motivated that. I read a book called Leadocracy which is leadership and democracy smashed into a word, which says we really want to hire leaders and not politicians. We want to hire people that have done things, solved problems. Um, my campaign was not elect Johnson or Johnson 2016. It was hire JJ. I wanted our electorate to hire me to solve problems. Um, that's, what, that's what motivated that. I, that I, Started saying I've repeated the question again because I didn't, there was something else I wanted to say. Yes, I, I guess I guess the main point of the question was that plan or that next step to create change. I yes, uh, that, that that approach to thinking about how can I create change? What's my next step that will allow me to create change now to create bigger change later? Got it. So so one thing that's been helpful in my career in creating change is not focusing on the immediate payoff, not focusing on the salary, for example. And I made a mistake early in my career when I switched from one law firm to another had offers from several competing firms and I made that choice. And I chose, made my decision based solely on money. And that turned out to be the biggest mistake of my professional career. There was a reason they were paying that much money and it meant I built 3,200 hours that year. I mean, it was brutal. Um, when I left there, I took a big pay cut to go to my next company. It wasn't too long before I was making just as much or more money. When I came to Overstock, I took an enormous pay cut. It took a little bit longer, but eventually I got up to where I was you know, making what I thought was good money. I would say if you want to affect change, think about what you're trying to do and don't get too focused on how am I going to get rich doing this. We always have to make ends meet. I understand that's part of it. But I think what's the goal and how do I see getting there is, is, is important. Does that address the question, Jaime? Yes, so. Okay, thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Jonathan Epstein. Uh, I'm a senior in the undergraduate business program here. Um, and I was wondering kind of as a person that's going into the workforce, um, kind of have a job set up, but I'm not really sure what I'm like passionate about. 
and it seems like it took you a little while to figure out what you were passionate about, but I was wondering if you could recommend ways in which you took opportunities to like, discover what you were passionate about, and maybe even for the MBAs who are re-entering the workforce, how we can like find these things that we're passionate about. Yeah, so uh, that's a good question. And um, even if you know what you're passionate about, it's hard to find a job that squarely fits that thing. Um, I've found that my work has been more interesting and I've become more passionate about it. When I've seen something in the company that needed to get done that really wasn't in my job description and volunteered to do it. Because then I was growing, I was learning something that got me excited and it expanded what I was able to do and what people thought I could do. For, frankly, when I came to Overstock and was in the legal department of one, I was sitting in a broom closet and was being asked to review non-disclosure agreements and just keep us out of trouble. It was not a meaningful position. And I'd been there a month and a contract came across my desk that was a request for a proposal from Palm Pilot. People may not know what those are. <laughs> Home pilot was, you know, the, the digital organizers. And they had been liquidating all of their returns on eBay, and they weren't pleased with the ROI they were getting. And so they were doing a request for proposal for other people. And it came across my desk because it had some legal terms, and I was marking that up. And I thought, wait a second, there's no one at this company who's going to captain this project so we win this request for proposal. So I went to the boss, and I said, let me captain this. He goes, well, what do you know about marketing? or testing in the warehouse, or IT. And I said, I know as much about those things as anyone else does about the sum total of this. What this project needs is some adult supervision. I'm that adult. <laughs> I wasn't really that much of an adult, but um, I got the assignment. We won the RFP. We had a bake-off with eBay. We beat them. We won that. And the next thing I knew, I'm the fifth member of the executive team. Next thing I know, I'm being asked to hire a general counsel and wear a business hat. I volunteered for something that was totally outside of what my job description was, and it got me excited about coming to work. Does that, make, does that address the question? Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Yeah. So we have to conclude now, but I want to thank you so much for coming out and sharing your wisdom with all of us. Holly, so. thank you. It's great. I, got to, I love being on campus. There's this energy here. I'm going to be a better, a better employee tomorrow because I was here. So thank you. Oh. Thank you.